Hey guys, Brooklyn here. This video will be a special video in that if you're the guy who always buys games and talks others into playing with him, uh, you can use this video and the two after as the only three videos to show your friends before you start playing Madara. All the other stuff, like setting up, reading encounters, component overviews, reading the adventure book, etc., can just be something that only you watch to familiarize yourself with. In this video, and the three after, we'll be going over what players need to know to get to the table and play outside of all the other stuff. So without further ado, let's get started. We're going to go over the three basic card types that players will use when controlling their adventurer. Adventurer cards, discipline cards, and item cards. Adventurer cards represent your adventurer and contain all the necessary information to play that character in Madara. All adventurer cards are printed on 5x6 sized cards. Their card type is listed in the top right of the card, says adventurer. To the left of the card type is the name of the adventurer. Below that is the stamina recovery bar. Adventurers use stamina points to make attacks, move, and take all sorts of other types of actions in Madara. The highlighted circles on the stamina recovery bar represent how many stamina points the adventurer gains each turn, while the total amount of circles printed represent the maximum stamina points that the adventurer can have at any given time. Most adventurers will gain three stamina points a turn and be able to have a maximum of five at any given time. Below the stamina recovery bar is the special ability associated with the adventurer. Our exuberant nightingale, for example, is looking for something very specific in her life, and as such, she's very ambitious. Next, below the ability, you can see the conviction and casting bar. These two bars are used to remind players what the adventurer's base conviction and casting dice are when no items that upgrades them are currently equipped. Nearly all adventurers will have purple dice in both of these rows. Conviction is used when a figure is attempting to resist the effects of a spell, while casting is used when a figure is attempting to affect another figure with a spell. At the bottom left, we have the adventurer's skills. This bar is used to make skill checks, such as jumping, running, or any other sort of narrative event that requires an adventurer to pass a check to determine a narrative and mechanical outcome not related directly to combat. The rules to a basic skill check are simple, and always use two purple dice. Let's say you open a chest and read the hidden text only to find that it's trapped and explodes, sending shrapnel and death in all directions. It will say something like, make an agility 10 check. If you fail, you are dealt five physical damage. To make a skill check, you'd roll two purple dice and add the agility value printed on your adventurer's card to the result. If the result is equal to or higher than the required skill check, in this case 10, you would pass. To the right of the skills are a set of stats. First, you have HP. This is the total damage that your adventurer can be dealt before being defeated. Second, you have defense. Defense represents how hard you are to hit with attacks. And third, you have movement. This is how many spaces or squares your adventurer may move when taking a move action. Finally, on the back of the adventurer card, you have fluff that tells a little bit about the character and the lore that surrounds them. The next card we want to go over is Disciplines. Disciplines represent the wide range of special abilities that your adventurer can perform. As you gain XP and progress through the game, you'll be able to customize your adventurer by spending XP to gain Disciplines. Each Discipline is part of a set of Disciplines called Discipline Trees. In Madara Unintentional Malum Act 1, there are five different Discipline Trees. Martial, Subterfuge, Assemblage, Cruor, and Sanctus. These five different trees are made up of our 110 different disciplines, with each tree containing 22 different options. Unlike other cards, disciplines are laid out horizontally. Disciplines are color-coded to help players differentiate between the different trees. Martial is blue, Subterfuge is dark purple, Assemblage is green, Cruor is red, and Sanctus is brown. Each discipline has their tree and level printed on the back. On the front, you'll find all the information required to use them. At the top is the title of the discipline. This is important because no adventurer can have more than one of the same named discipline. Below the title is the tree and level listed again. Below that 
is the abilities the discipline grants your adventurer. Some disciplines will also have flavor text at the bottom. This text has no mechanical use and is just for fun. In the top left of the card, you'll see the amount of XP that must be spent to acquire the discipline. Below that, some disciplines might have a stamina point cost. Disciplines that do not have a stamina point cost will activate using other parameters. So whether you're playing the crawl mode or the adventure mode, disciplines are acquired using XP. When playing the crawl mode, this is when starting the scenario. When playing the adventure mode, this is done during story rounds or when adventure mechanics specifically say you can spend XP. To learn disciplines, an adventurer must spend XP to acquire it. Uh, the XP required to learn a discipline is listed in the top left of the discipline the adventurer desires. So that means that disciplines can be mixed and matched to customize your adventure. However, adventurers must learn a level one discipline from a tree before they can learn a higher level discipline of the same tree. Meaning they are required to have at least one discipline from each lower level of the same tree to learn them. So for example, an adventurer can only learn a level three Kruor discipline if they already have a level one and a level two Kruor discipline. In addition, if an adventurer wants to acquire another discipline that is the same level as a discipline they already own, even if it's from a different tree, the cost and XP increases by one for each additional discipline of that level they own. So, for example, if an adventurer wanted to learn Quick Blow, but already had two other disciplines that were level one, Quick Blow would cost five instead of three. Other than those rules, adventurers can mix and match disciplines to their heart's desire. This can produce an incredible amount of options that can be overwhelming at first to many players, so for this reason, we've thrown together some starter packs in the adventure mode to help players pick, but outside of that, we hope that building characters is something that you have as much fun doing as we did. We've also included a variant rule to respec your character during a story round if you find, you know, halfway into a campaign that your build sucks or you'd rather just try something different. The last card type that every adventurer will share are item cards. Item cards are standard Euro-sized cards and come in six different types that are color-coded to help players identify them. Weapons are red, armor is blue, cores are teal, accessories are pink, relics are green, and consumables are brown. All item cards share a similar layout. At the top is the item name. Below that is the gold value of the item. This is how much gold must be spent to acquire the item. Below that is the item icons. These icons represent the various bonuses the adventurer gains by equipping this item. It can also contain symbols that detail certain attributes about the item. To the right and near the top is the item tags. These tags will sometimes have mechanical purposes, but in many cases they are only ever referenced by other abilities. We've included a list of tags to help players sort out which ones mean what in the rulebook. Uh, of course, there's an image of the item in the center of the card. Uh, below the image will be the item text. This is where you can find unique special abilities associated with that item that adventurers can use while the item is equipped. Um, and at the bottom of the item is a black bar. Many items will leave this black bar blank. However, sometimes you'll find symbols in this bar. We call these symbols symbol abilities. Symbol abilities are special abilities that can only be used when making an attack while that item is equipped. On the back of the item, you'll find the tier the item belongs to. This is important since whenever you find an item or when you're purchasing items with gold, the adventure book or crawl book will specifically mention what loot level the players are in or what tier of items are available. So for example, at the very start of the adventure, only mundane items are for sale. Okay, so let's start with some specifics about each item type. Weapons are red and represent the tools used by adventurers to defeat opponents. Weapons will list their weapon type as a tag in the top right. Many weapons will have abilities that can only be used when mixed with uh, another weapon of a specific type. So for example, the hand axe is a one-handed weapon that has an ability that can only be used when the other weapon it's paired with is a shield, axe, or sword. Weapons will also always contain one or more combat dice in their icons. Combat dice represent how good the weapon is 
and they're the dice that you will roll when making an attack action against an opponent. Combat dice are also color-coded. As they get better, the numbers on these dice will increase. Using the back of the rule book as a quick guide, you can see what dice are better and which ones are worse. These dice gradually get better and have a set amount of symbols depending on which set is being rolled. In short though, the higher the number on the dice, the more likely the weapon is to hit a target, and the better the symbols, in relation to the weapon you're using anyway, the more damage the weapon will do when it hits. We'll go over this in more depth when we get to combat, but for now, just know that these dice get better as you progress through the game. So below the combat dice, the weapon will have an icon that displays how many hands they take to wield, and whether or not they're a melee or a ranged weapon. If it's a ranged weapon, like this crossbow, it will specifically say what the range of the weapon is next to the icon. In this case, it's a four, meaning that you'd be able to uh, make an attack with the crossbow up to four spaces away. In addition, most weapons will have symbol abilities at the bottom that augment their damage when making attacks. All right, so on the topic of weapons, let's talk about some specifics. First of all, the limitations. In Madara, you can equip any combination of one-handed weapons so long as both weapons share the same range icon, meaning you can't equip a hand crossbow and a short sword, since one is melee and one is ranged. However, some weapons have a symbol that look like this. We call this symbol the melee ranged icon. This symbol means that it can be equipped with either a ranged or a melee weapon. Shields are a good example of this. Shields have the melee range symbol and can be equipped with either a short sword or a hand crossbow. The second limitation when choosing a weapon is the hand icons. You can never have more than two hands worth of weapons equipped, since you only have two hands. Meaning you could have a two-handed crossbow or a hand crossbow and a shield or two hand crossbows, but you could never have a long bow in one hand and a hand crossbow in the other. Okay, because some of you are probably wondering, it's possible to make builds in Madara that can contain both a ranged and melee loadout. In fact, some items can easily switch between the two, allowing you to go from range to melee in an instant. Just in case you want to Legolas down some orcs across the river right before you Gimli a big ogre right next to you. So just because you can't equip the two types at the same time doesn't mean you can't make a viable build that uses both on a single turn. The next item type we want to talk about is armor. You'll see that armor contains all the same information as weapons, only the icons are different and the symbol abilities are missing. This will be what you can expect from all other item types in this video, the only exception being that some of the other item types might have some flavor text listed where the symbol abilities would normally be on a weapon. Okay, so back to armor. Armor is used to protect yourself from damage once you've been hit. Uh, the armor value represented here is direct damage reduction, meaning when you're hit by an attack, the damage is reduced by this amount before damage is dealt to you. In addition, armor will usually increase your maximum hit points while equipped. Armor comes in different types as noted by the tag in the top right. You can expect some armor types to produce similar abilities and be used in specific ways regardless of how awesome they get. So, for example, cloth armor will always grant horrible damage reduction, but give you lots of opportunities to dodge attacks. So the idea would be that you would focus on not getting hit over reducing damage when you are hit. While something like a cuirass will grant a good balance in damage reduction while also not hurting your mobility. Next up, we have cores. In Madara, a core is a magical device that is widely used by society. It's defensive in nature and provides a non-tangible protective field around its user at all times, choosing to only manifest its defensive capabilities when harm is imminent. Cores share icons that increase your defense value, meaning that they reduce your chance of being hit, and due to the fact that in Madara, any attack made against you that hits you beyond your defense causes additional damage, the defense bonus granted by cores also reduces the damage you take naturally. Cores are incredibly valuable, and they're essential as you progress in Madara. Cores will fundamentally allow you to survive horrific attacks made by monsters well beyond what a human could normally expect to fight. Like armor and weapons, cores come in different types that grant their own special abilities and augment certain builds in different ways. For example, 
The utility core is usually a lesser sentient creature that can obtain items for you between encounters, while the defensive core is a trinket hung on the body that keeps you safe from even magical attacks. Adventurers are limited to equipping a single core at any given time. Accessories represent an item that is worn like armor, but isn't actually armor. You know, like something you wear on your body everywhere you go, but isn't covering your whole body. Accessories share no specific properties and can wildly augment builds. So they can be anything from a backpack that increases the amount of consumables you can carry to magical spray-on latex-like armor that can be worn beneath your normal armor to further decrease specific types of damage. Accessories are unique in that they are designed to scale beyond their tier, meaning that even accessories acquired early on in a story can be useful at uh, very late stages of the game. An adventurer is limited to equipping a single accessory at any given time. Relics represent all the small miscellaneous things that an adventurer either carries within arm's reach at all times or has adorned themselves with. Uh, they thematically vary greatly, even more so than accessories. Uh, they can be anything from enchanted piercings that grant protection, to tattoos with charmed ink that increase your hit points, or even arcane fitted hats or magical belt buckles. Um, the utility and mechanical ramifications of relics can change your build almost entirely by themselves. Relics can share all the icons that armors, cores, or accessories have and more. An adventurer is limited to equipping up to three relics at any given time. The last item card type is consumables. These items are always discarded when used. They're potions, magic bombs, elixirs. Um, these types of items come and go at a rapid pace in Madara and are the backbone to many team compositions. They're commonly earned in chests and sometimes even drop in bulk. An adventurer is limited to equipping up to three consumables at any given time. So together, adventurer cards, discipline cards, and item cards make up the totality of what a player utilizes when playing Madara. We've included a recommended layout for our cards in the rulebook, and of course we have our play mats, which are sold separately, and they have their own layout that we've played with. Thanks for checking out this item video, and next we'll talk about how to read and use specific abilities.